You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 100, the finishing touches that take zirconia hybrids from good to great with Conrad and Jack of Absolute Dental Services. In this episode, we complete the trifecta of episodes with Conrad and Jack, where we've talked about full arch implant prosthetics from start to finish. After discussing how what you do matters, now we're gonna talk about what the lab does that matters. It's really that important. It makes the difference between zirconia that could last a lifetime and a prosthesis that doesn't even survive the trip in the FedEx truck. The final five minutes is everything. What does that mean? Find out soon with us on this episode of The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call one 800 472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Des Moines, Iowa this fall 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And just coming off that intro, I just I just got to say, Wes, I mean, you guys just heard the intro. If you didn't, if you fast forwarded it, go back. Because I was trying to find a way when I was recording this intro to describe the contrast between zirconia that's like awesome and lasts forever and zirconia that just falls apart. And I, we were trying to like think of ways to say that. And Wes goes... Zirconia that falls apart like a Blue Origin test rocket. And I was like, oh, burn, man. What's going on? And he's like, well, tell him what you said, Wes. I mean, just just what did you... I mean, we both have this shared... Well... We didn't even know we had this. I didn't know this. I mean, we, we both are NASA space junkies, you know? So <clears throat> Nerds. I, I am totally for the commercial commercialization of space flight. I think it's been one of the best things that's happened to the space industry. And I am loving the competition that's going on. And, and for some reason, for some reason, I have a problem. Well, I know why. I have a problem with Jeff Bezos winning, right? I, I don't want him to win, Yep. right? And some of you probably out there are like, well, I like Amazon. I like Amazon. Well, I like Amazon too. But, I don't want one man to dominate everything. And John, well, I want I, one man like to dominate it. it, and it's Elon Musk. Okay. Well, well I want that. Right. We just don't. Right. We. So, I didn't even realize that you felt this way, Wes. And Wes is start. He starts going down this thing, and I was like, dude, I totally agree. I don't know what it is about Bezos, and he's probably you know if he's listening to this, he'll just he'll, you know he'll destroy us. I'm sure. Well, like a cruise missile <laughs> is currently on its way to, to my side. house. But you know. Right. Everyone knows Elon Musk is Tony Stark. We we all know that. That's right. And then we were kind. Of, well, who is who is Jeff Bezos? If 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 Elon is likened to Tony right. Stark, and you made the call, who Lex, Lex Luthor. Luthor? And I was like, yes, Lex Luthor, man, because it's part of it's yeah. the shaved head. It's the shaved head, and part of it is like <laughs> unlimited money, and and so it's and he's got the foreign talus muscle that needs the yes, Botox. He going needs on the there. Botox, <laughs> and 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 the uh, and the thing is, Lex was smart, and Jeff is smart. Yes, but, but he was always kind of like the evil, like he seemed like the evil guy, but he wasn't completely evil. Lex Luthor wasn't completely evil, but he was always like he wanted to just dominate the world. For the sake of, if you go to if you go to Google and you take type in SpaceX versus, right SpaceX yeah, versus large SpaceX versus right the okay it's it's versus NASA yeah. versus Blue Origin is the right. next thing, right, right, right. it's right. been searched people are talking about this it's the billionaire space race right right. Right. And we, I'm just going to say, the dental guys, we're coming out. Come in out favor. and say, we're for, we are in Team favor Musk. of Elon. 
Team Musk, here we go. Exactly. I mean, because because this guy, I mean, Elon, he when people tweet sometimes about like some some literal, you know, sp- like we will have a rocket scientist tweet at him about something that they think that that he doesn't understand. Oh. And sometimes, not you, not, he doesn't tweet a lot, but sometimes he will reply with like, a, a, like an equation that he's been working right. on. Rocket science, John. Yeah, just he rocket, speaks just say rocket, rocket science. science, man. Just he, right? He speaks rocket. So science. I mean, you gotta respect. I mean, the what guy, guy speaks? Come on, he started PayPal. Right. 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 And now he's talking rocket science. We went from swiping credit cards right. to launching. Rockets. And in his spare time, so he's you know me, making cars and then. Roof, solar roof tiles, and all this stuff. So, look, Bezos, we appreciate your contributions. I will continue to buy, you know, cat food from you, uh, delivered to my door. I bought some spray. Weekly, you know, I buy my cereal. I eat the same cereal every day for like my whole life. My kids say it's cardboard, (laughs) and Amazon delivers it faithfully. What grape nuts? No, it's not grape nuts, dude. (laughs) It's do you eat, do you eat muesli? No, <laughs> from musk. Oh my! Just because it has musk in the name? No, 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 no. I I, I do not eat grape nuts, dude. <laughs> what are you eating? So I eat kashi, go lean. Oh no, you're are you crunchy? I, I'm not that you crunchy. crunchy That's guys. The thing is I'm actually not, but it's kashi, go lean crunch. Breakfast oh, cereal, and I get it. Hey, and, you know, and, guys, if you know what John likes, now you can go. When you see him at the trade right. shows, when you see him at the booth, podcasting, bring him, bring him a bowl. Because if, bring yeah, I mean, bowl, because gosh, this is the thing, like, go I'm in. an extremely boring person, Wes, in terms of my... We know that, peanut butter and jelly Dude, lunch, routines, I'm day. a routine guy. Like, I eat the same lunch every day. I eat the same breakfast <laughs> every day. So it's Kashi, go lean, cr- if you want to be like me, which I know you all do, you're definitely thinking, <laughs> how can I be more like John the Dental Guy? If you want to be like me... Start your morning with Kashi Golin Crisp Toasted Berry Crumble Cereal. Order it in the bulk pack from oh, Amazon. Man. Recurring delivery every <laughs> eighth of the month, okay? That's how I roll. <laughs> so good, and, so fresh. And I eat that and some hard-boiled eggs every morning and, that, and coffee. Mm. And I mean, you know, you can just predict it. So anyway, I will continue to order my Kashi Golin Crisp Toasted Berry Crumble from Jeff Bezos, and I will gladly pay him for that. But when it comes to the space race, the dental guys are coming out in favor yeah. of, of SpaceX, man. I'm sorry. Team Musk, here we go. So now, listen, change the subject. Right now, we're in the midst of restorative driven implants fall 2019 session. All yeah. right. We're in, De- we're in Des Moines, Iowa, right? We're out there. We're doing Series 1, Series 2 in Des Moines. Then we're going to go up to Lac de Flambeau, Wisconsin. You don't need to know where that is. Just know it's in northern Wisconsin. Right. Amazing clinic. And we have an amazing facility where we're going to be placing lots of dental implants and over-the-shoulder, one-on-one training, fully guided surgery, custom tissue formers, CTs, merging it, all kinds of stuff, <clears throat> immediate extraction, immediate placement. You're going to learn about all these things at Restore Driven Implants that are the state-of-the-art. Listen, we have just reviewed... And some of our um, treatment, um, I don't know, really treatment planning sessions, we've been reviewing the content of restored and driven implants over the summer. And we can't be more proud of what we're teaching and how modern it is. And I'm excited about next year, John, because we're going to be coming to two new cities uh, next year. Uh, In 2020, in the spring of 2020, write this down, because I know some of you have been talking to us about wanting to come to restored and driven implants. In 2020, January 23rd through the tw- to the 1st, we're going to be going to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, okay? The Twin Cities, right? The Twin Cities, and we're going to be there for Series 1 and Series 2. You can check out the dates at RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. The res- link is in the description below. Series 1 and Series 2 will be there in St. Paul. And then uh, Series 3, of course, up in the clinic at the Peter Christensen Dinner- Dental Center. And then in the fall... Oh, John. Oh. Chicago. Chi Town. Chicago, right? And you know, as well as we know, that we love Chicago. Oh, yeah. That's why we're going there. And um, so if you can't make the spring session in 2020, we've got the fall session already planned out. The dates are there at restorativedrivenimplants.com. 
Um, I'm excited about restorative driven implants. Yep. We've we've, we've, One of the we've things really that, we feel like our our curriculum, as Wes said, is as up to date. I mean, it was interesting. We just talked a couple times briefly. We're gonna have a bigger review later on about Lincoln Vicious' new book, Zero Bone Loss Concepts. And it mm. was just so mm. cool because we've been following him and his research, which we feel like is truly where we should be right now. And this book comes out, and I read it, and I called Wes, and I said, Wes, this book is what we're teaching at RDI to the T. This is what we teach our students about where implants need to go with regard to bone and soft tissue and connection type. And everything that's in that book is what you're going to learn. It's the most modern, in our opinion, it's the most modern approach to implant dentistry that's predictable. I don't mean, it's not bleeding edge. It's not bleeding edge. Right. It's not unproven. It's proven, scientifically based, something that will create a predictable system in your practice. We're very proud of the fact that we have kept it modern, as hopefully you'd expect from I'm us. I'm excited. I'm excited. John and I are always about taking high-level education and bringing that back so that you guys can digest it. <clears throat> and really understand, well, one, is it for you? Number two, is it for us to put into our practice? But we always like to take it from the highest of highest levels. And in December this year, 2019, uh, we are going with some colleagues of ours to take Pat Allen's soft tissue grafting course, how to graft um, with connective tissue and alloderm around teeth and implants, how to evaluate these sites. And Listen, I'm excited. Yep. Um, I've not taken a course from Pat Allen. I have heard him talk, but I've not taken a actual like paid course. Right. And and he's the best. Uh, we're of the going best down to Texas as far as soft tissue, especially with alloderm. And he's going to talk about yeah. alloderm and you know connective tissue grafting. Texas. And we both feel we like that's been kind of a blind spot that we've had. You know, we know about it and we know how to refer it, and we don't want to do all of it necessarily, but we want to understand no. it and we want to be able to, to bring that back to our practices, maybe and apply it, maybe implement it and maybe just be able to have that as a, an understanding at the highest level of what's possible out there uh, along with our specialists. And we just take it, I mean, who are you going to take soft tissue grafting from? You're going to take it from only a couple of people. You know, you're going to look right. at somebody like Picos or Salama or Pat Allen. And yep. most people we talked to have said that he's at the top of his game. So we're really excited. We're excited to to about that. Be a part and, of that. And uh, those that are listening that are going with us, uh, we're excited for you to join us. Yeah. And uh, maybe we'll let you carry our bags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, right? it's going to be, no, we're going to be, we're going to be man. the people there that will be the most, like, we're going to know the least, I feel like, Wes. There's, and I'm excited no, about that. You know, but you know where we sit, John. You know where yeah, we sit. Front sat. row, man. Front row. And, you know, I don't know about you. But the first time I met John, I said, John, you know, I kind of like, he's like, dude, don't say anything else. That's where That's I go. That's where we go. All right. I go right up the front row. Yeah, not you ashamed. Know? So listen, I don't sneak in and sneak out. Right. We're there. Right? I sneak in and I like sneak in to stay. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, the, only time, the only thing that gets me out is drinking too much coffee. That's the only thing that oh, I got to, I got to have a break. That's what happens. So we're, we're going to yeah, bring, we're happens. excited to get to bring that back to the show as well and just kind of talk to you about that class and whether it's something you should take, whether it's something you should be looking at, how how mm. applicable is it to the GP practice, um, all of that. So that's something coming up. So I, I guess what we're, what we're trying to kind of give you guys today is a little bit of what we're up to. You know, what's going to be coming up this fall, this winter, next year, how you can engage with us. Uh, you can always engage with us on social media. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to, what you, where you want to see us, if there's meetings you want to see us go to, things you want us to learn more about. Bring that to us. I'm excited, Wes, about this episode we're about to get into because this is kind of the, the trifecta here of, of three great episodes with a high level, a couple of guys talking about some high level topics with full art zirconia. So uh, we're going to be talking about today how important a lot of the lab side of this is in making your zirconia last. So um, thanks for being again with us. Uh, we think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So after a brief uh, a time with our sponsor. We're going to bring you episode 100 with Jack and Conrad from Absolute Dental Services. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to talking more about that next time on The Dental Guys. This is Justin Goodbrand. Here is today's tip. 
How much cash should you have in your bank accounts? I recently noticed a trend where advisors are telling dentists to hold very large amounts of cash to balance their investments. Look, it's important for us to have cash, but it's even more important for you to have access to cash. For many dentists, if you keep one month's worth of operating expenses in your business checking account, one month's worth of operating expenses in your business savings account, and three months worth of your basic living expenses in your home checking or savings account, you'll be fine. All of the cash should be invested for maximum long-term benefit. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, so we're back with Jack and Conrad and welcome to this episode of The Dental Guy. And if you haven't listened to <laughs> wow. the last episode, a lot's happened. John. You really need to stop right now and go back to the last episode, which was released two weeks ago. Stop! Don't listen to this. Yeah, you because to you, you, it's just like you know, see, having dessert before you've you've had dinner. So so just stop and go back and listen because what we've done up to this point. First of all, Conrad and Jack from Absolute Dental Services in Durham, North Carolina, have welcome been to with the show us. Again. Welcome, welcome back. Oh. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Great to have you guys back. And and we this was such a good conversation once again that is kind of poured over into uh, an additional episode mm -hmm. because this what we've done in the last episode, Wes, is we've gone through all of the steps in fabrication of a zirconia hybrid right prosthetic. Up, we went from impression to verification jig mm -hmm. to how to capture a bite whether you're using wax rims or whether you're using digital the versus the analog yeah, the digital versus the analog libraries and yeah all this kind of stuff to go back there and check that out but we're right up to the where the patient gets delivered the prototype the, the magic the yeah. disney disney has showed up it's happened the magic of conrad and jack that's right and <laughs> and i want to dig into this a little bit more on on a couple of things okay we finished this last episode talking about prototypes and we talked about a printed prototype being given to the patient which is a quick easy way to get a snapshot of where you're at or did all of the information you right. gave the lab turn into something that that looks reasonable make your changes to that then we talked about making a long term interim, a long-term prosthesis and the advantages of that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, th there's a step there that we didn't talk a lot about before going to the final, which is how do we communicate back to you guys before that final delivery happens that we like everything about the provisional and how, or, or if there are changes that need to be made. Because there's some discussion that I've had with labs about do we need to send the exact transitional prosthesis back to you? Um, can you make changes to that, or is that something that we should avoid? Um, and yeah. what about, you know, are there easier methods than just sending it back? What about digital mm. methods? And I'd love to hear you guys just talk about going from that, what information do you need, and, and how so, can we provide it to you from the the, that, that long-term prosthetic to the final. It's very much key in, in kind of putting it out there right now, early on in the beginning. Um, do not, do not push going to final. Um, and once, once whatever we have at that point is accepted, 100%, you'll hear me ask, and I'll call them up and, and the patient, and once the patient approves 100%, your approval is 100%, what you see is exactly what you will get. And that's why it's so predictable, but we can't come back and, and say, oh, well, you know what, now we changed our mind. Mm. So r no matter what, you have to be 100% confident as a clinician with, with your patient, the patient, that they understand that this is the acceptance of this restoration as it stands. And I want to be w really clear on that because I think there's a little bit of a problem with this, and you guys, I'm sure, see it not just on the hybrid side, but the crown and bridge side mm -hmm. of, well, I'm going to send you an impression of temporaries, provisionals, and the patient likes all of the things except the following. Mm. Right. And I'd like you to make these changes. Now, the, there's a list like five. What do you ten, What do you say? There's when there's that's no the there's no guarantee, and we do this a lot. What I mean, and I've always worked a lot in prosthodontics. Um, and one of the things in prosthodontics, 
if you know all things being perfect is i don't i don't do anything right they've established everything and at that point they give it to me and say jack make this yeah, copy right this, is yeah. copy this um if that's where we want to get to that's yeah. where we want to get to if it comes to me and they say move the midline over a millimeter and a half shorten 7 through 10 point seven five mil. all of that there's no everything's off the table another all bets are off the table yep. that's that's another prototype or you even might as well if just it make was another prototype right might right. as well that's exactly doing, yeah. especially if if you're looking at even if it if it was on dentition right say we had a full upper rehab um you got to do. I still mm. do prototypes on dentition. There's yeah. no reason not to. Sure. Midline and, and can't if, anything like that. Fox's oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Change oh, the vertical until, until it hits on all cylinders, and yeah. it is a hundred percent. It is it it because it absolutely destroys predictability, mm. and and it, it it could you know, it's a guess once again, right? We want to get to the point to where no we, question. There's no question. Yeah. That is the final restoration. And once you're there, I can guarantee you and he can guarantee you that you're going to get exactly mm. that back. And to this point, yeah, we were, we were uh, presenting at a meeting a couple of weekends ago, and Jack and I actually had this argument. Mm. And listen to the argument. I said we have about a 5% adjustment rate when we deliver a full arch hybrid case. Not a remake rate, an adjustment rate actually having to touch the hybrid. And Jack looked at me kind of on stage and was like, I don't agree with you. It's less than that. Mm -hmm. And what it's a considerably great, less what than a that. great place to be to argue about, you know, not remaking a case anymore, but adjustments. Our remake rate, and it's not just us. I think everybody that mm -hmm. knows what they're doing with these are very predictable. So yeah. I'm not trying to, to blow our own horn here. I think this is more predictable restorer of options than anything else we do if you do it right. If you follow the steps and the protocols so, and don't and you don't don't, don't try to don't take a shortcut, mm. don't try to avoid one. You know, some of the things and, and we're gonna get to the final restoration, but if I could for a quick moment, some of the things that we put in our protocol manual, um, you know, often asked questions, things that we come across, some of the things we see a lot of times too, um, is you know, as you could see. This is a lengthy process, right? And it takes a lot of time to go through the steps and go through the steps accurately and gather the proper information each time. A lot of times we'll get to see that, you know, it's a rush or the patient wants them right away or it's kind of being driven from that end or what do you mean it's going to take three weeks to fabricate the final restoration? Uh, we want it in one week and it's it's... Anything like that that's injected into the flow could be disastrous when we get to the final, right? So it's very important to take the time to go through the steps in the in the process. And, and it's only and about a six week process. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's not like we're it's, asking it's for not months. that bad. Mm -hmm. And and if you do, it's it's the same thing I tell everybody because a lot of times something something here that's 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 really interesting at Absolute is we deal with a ton of first time clinicians. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time uh, GPs, right? That this case, you know, they sent this case to their oral surgeon, oral surgeon placed the implants, did the conversion, sent it back to them, referred it back to them for the restorative. And they're very it's it's very overwhelming, right? First time this walks sure. into your office to restore. And I tell them, stick with me, stick with Conrad. We're gonna walk you through this every step of the way. Just follow the step in the process. And mm. and you know, like I said, these are the greatest restorations you could have in your laboratory or your practice, or they could be absolutely disasters. And I have guys that have built complete practices mm. off of restoring these alone. Yeah. Right? Mm. Restoring these alone. So and, let and me let me dig let me digress just briefly and we, we we won't. I don't want to go off in the high weeds, but when in, when you have these, you mentioned you have a lot of new clinicians come in, right? And they say, "All right, this is my first case. I really want to get into doing this dentistry." And you know, oftentimes the way that they get into it is like you say, it shows up. It shows right. up at their practice. They are in a conversion prosthesis. Do you find that they do follow the protocol? Or do you find actually? That I think that it is actually I, was gonna say, I think the first time guys follow the protocols just more. Follow yeah, the simple then, protocol. then the veterans, <laughs> the veterans are the are the guys who goes. I don't know if I have to mal verify because that's interesting. And, and, 
Yeah, and yeah. so you're saying the most experienced clinicians in doing this are actually the ones you struggle with the most. I gotta in say, yeah. I gotta say that yeah. the new Sometimes. guys, their first one, they're they're kind of into it, they're excited, but they're scared at the same time. And, that and, scare is actually yeah, good. Yeah, and, and they actually they call us up, Jack Conrad, help me. You know, yeah. this and, and just I think walks it's, in. It's just we're gonna get in real trouble with our <laughs> long-standing customers here, but um, Jack, none of none Jack of none said of, it, yeah. not me. Um, yeah. But what I think it's a testament to if you follow the steps and you follow them religiously, I think you know these things are extremely predictable. And they're time proven. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're time proven and they're they're absolutely bulletproof. They, I guess what really, I'm trying really to get. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, are you? Are you? I'm starting to sweat. Do you man. feel I know good? What you're gonna say. I'm gonna do say you, it. Do you <laughs> feel good about the future of, of clinical dentistry based upon the new clinicians that you're seeing that are getting into this? Do you feel good? Does it make you feel positive, or do you long I, I for? Do. Or do you long mm. for I a do. time where there was a different way of looking at things? Do you feel like it's getting better? Do you feel like it's getting worse? I think well, technology you know, is helping us. So technology much to is be more helping us, yeah. and I gotta say the 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 newer clinicians. Um, you know, and, and I work with a lot of the the universities and the academic pro the residencies, and it's a very, I would say that they're more, they're more they're looking more for that support than they ever have before, right? That's great. Um, and we've kind of established ourselves is it's not you know we don't do. You know, the restorative is the bonus side of what we do. That's the default. That's the byproduct of the relationship that mm. we hold together. Mm -hmm. um, and we're we're a resource. We're here to ask the questions. And I, I, I think that they're more open to asking the questions and communicating now mm. than ever before, especially with the younger uh, clinicians that are well-versed in the technology. This becomes mm. second nature to them. It's very, very easy mm. okay. uh, to communicate and, and work with us. You know, on a case like that, you know, because we do so many CONUS cases, and, and normally when, when somebody has a bad experience with CONUS, they don't want to do it again. And I've always said, it's either the clinician or the technician that made a mistake. It's either, you know, small issues that you didn't pick up on. We just finished a uh, CONUS case. We're in the process of finishing a CONUS case with UNC grad process with Dr. Cook. And they asked every step, what, what do we do? What do we need to be careful of? And that case is going to be a success. I, I'll be it's extremely be perfect, surprised yeah. if there's anything there. So I think what we've seen is the jump between digital and analog worlds are so much more predictable. Mm. The fact that you have, we have the ability to give you a prototype which is based off a diagnostic wax up, which is based off patient smile pictures, which is based off what the patient wants, and accurately transfer that to the mouth is a huge jump. And if you're a clinician, you have to make use of that because that will yeah. save you clinical chair time. Well, that's great. What, yeah. I guess what I'm hearing is, is that digital doesn't make so much you know, things. Maybe it does make things a little faster because it helps you catch errors mm. before you get too far along in the process. Yep. Um, because it's it's you can maybe see things happening before you get so far down the path that it's too late. Is that yep. what you found that digital provides? Because you keep saying that like prototypes, things because like that. The process is daunting. Okay, for a new clinician, right? You know? It sure is. It's it's so many things. It's so many steps. It's so many dots, eyes, and cross T's mm. that the experienced clinician tries to figure out ways around those things. Mm. And digital lets you say, okay, maybe we could. Let's try to catch that. And you hmm. you see something change digitally. You is see that what, what you're I saying? think we've the, the one thing I think we've seen change is so there's always been two issues: clinical mistakes and lab mistakes. So let's say you as a clinician do everything right, you verify your models, but we pour the model incorrectly. Yeah. It it dilutes what you've done as a clinician. If you don't take a good bite, it's hard for us to get to a good try-in. What digital has done is eradicated hand mistakes. You know, the, the little mistakes. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. It's still there, but it stops us. You know, when I started doing ceramics, I had to learn tooth contour. Our ceramists now are learning how to work on three shape. The true magic in our work comes in the last five minutes of the contouring. Mm. That's where the artistry comes yes. in now. We don't have to build a full contour crown anymore. It's done by machine, and then we make it look like a tooth. 
So I, so I do think it's made us more efficient, and, it, and it's yeah. really helped make these processes more predictable. Well, and so. things, simple things like does it fit the matrix, the, the matrices have become obsolete because it's the same digital restoration, file, yeah. it's the right. same digital file, it's just been remilled in a different material. Right. So, and, you, so it, you mentioned with, with that in mind, you know, knowing that you can have that repeatability and mm. that ability to, to see you know, comparing the same essentially data different data sets in the same area, um, going back to this provisional. So you mentioned, you know, you said it has to be 100%. You know, the patient has to be 100% happy. So that's the patient part of things. Um, what else do you need to go to final from, from the clinician? What, what information do you need? So it's, it's, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because you started mentioning about this in the last episode. If you're, I mean, in some instances, if everything is 100% perfect and, and it is signed off and, and we know this and we've gone through it and we've communicated, I mean, there's instances where I can take that file and there's zero changes to that file. If you did not change that provisional if at all. If you did not yeah. change it at all. I mean, I could, re- I could have that file milled out before the master records get back to finish that mm. zirconia restoration. Do you need the prosthetic? Do you need no, the so that's if there are no changes made? So... Sometimes and sometimes not, yeah. depending. So Conrad, let me jump in here and then you really want to say something. Yeah, <laughs> because there's, there's such a very efficient jump now with this. So there's three ways to get that mm. to Jack, and then you know I'll I'll let you go on with this. The first one is take the hybrid out, send it back to us, and we'll do the yeah. The but records. what's the patient going to wear? Because that's the yeah. first thing the clinician says. Ah, the patient amen. So right, hates they hate that. Going back to the conversion, it's all with. nasty. It yeah. smells like So what like what mold. do you what do you tell them? You just say you got to tell the patient you got to go back to the nasty. Yeah, that's right. So, or you make a so second one. Either take it out and bring it, bring it to us, and yeah. you know that's that's mm-hmm. not comfortable. The second option is, and this is where technology is helping. You can take a full arch impression of that hybrid in the mouth, and we spoke about this in the previous uh, episode. We call it model matching. Now, model matching is accurate, but it's not the most accurate jump we have because mm-hmm. if we mismatch the model by just a little bit, it will throw something off. Right. In that case, I think you still go back to a printed provisional. You make sure everything is where it needs to be. Send that back to the lab, and then Jack goes to so the final. That's, that's the problem I've had with model matching is that yep. I don't think the mergers. I think that are getting better in 3Shape yep. and Zircon Zon, mm-hmm. but I don't think that model matching is perfect because... Yep. When you model match, and I and I'm looking at the model matches, mm-hmm. I just can't. We can't. Mm. You can't see that it's perfect. No, no there's right. always a little bit and, of that. And therefore, when you seat that final hybrid, there is a small ch- adjustment, mm. whether it's glaze or whatever it is on your hybrid occlusal surfaces mm. that you're doing. There's. I would not definitely perfect. in that case go back to a printed, send it back, try it in real That's quick. That's the best and way because you're all yeah. laboratory scanners. That's are right. Better. And we can just so you would say, let me make sure when you say go back to a printed, let's be specific about what does that mean? Because what information would you want to go back to printed? Because let's say you've adjusted this, right? You've given us a long term provisional. Yep. Mm-hmm. We've made some ad- slight adjustments to occlusion, perhaps, mm. and we're happy. So then you say, well, we want to go back to a printed so the patient doesn't have to go without their teeth. Yep. We still need to show you the adjustments that we've made. So is that taking an over impression or how do no, we get I, that? I think this is where digital impressions are really valuable. Yeah, we just you, did could, a, you could scan it. Just scan that provisional. In the mouth, not on the mouth. In the mouth, scan it. In the mouth, scan as much of the rugae and all the anatomy as you can. Why would you can. not just scan Why it on the model? Why not scan it on the model? Because, well, because we take to, it off as we, well. But we're trying to model match back into our data. But so, you, but here, I'm gonna kinda just jump in here a little bit, Sure. okay? As, a, as I'm thinking that if I send you, okay, okay, so I've got a three-shape scanner in my office, let's say, okay, and if I send you the prototype, okay, you're going to bolt it down to the master model, and you're going to put it in a lab scanner, whatever that yep. is, and you're going to scan it right there in your lab. Mm-hmm. So how, what would it not be better for me to just to take that hybrid out of the patient's yeah. mouth, bolt it down and take my three shape scanner? It's yeah, the exact same what, thing that's what yeah. I've versus doing. the mouth. So because the I mouth, that, change, yeah, what advantage would the mouth There's changes give that can happen in the mouth. So I think scanning in the mouth might be a little bit more accurate with the model matching because we're working 
directly off the data in the mouth in relationship to that hybrid versus we are, and this is, you know, this is something I think Mark Ludlum might have a really good input on, is what would the advantages be? The case we did out of personal experience, we scanned the upper and lower intraorally, scanned the byte, and we had an STL file with upper, lower, and byte, byte files. Mm -hmm. We were able to separate those and then model match the case and jumped from that into a small diagnostic change and to the final. But you're still what is it your model match um, a scan of of the model? It, it's not a scan of an impression of the mouth, it's a scan of the model, right? That you're matching scan to of the a model, scan of yeah. the mouth. Yeah. That's right. So Mm -hmm. I'm well, I'm gonna ch I'm gonna change a little bit I'm gonna change a little bit <laughs> this amongst this all. No, this is what it's all <laughs> Cause, about, man. Because like, this, this, this is this is actually what I would do. Um, if you have it in the mouth and it's exactly the way it needs to be, but you've made occlusal adjustments and you've made some adjustments to size of ledge position and that I'm gonna eliminate the whole rest of that process and I'm gonna have them scan flag it and I'm gonna have them scan the actual perfect provisional that's been adjusted, and I'm gonna get that STL on, and I'm just on gonna send it to the mills. Or in the mouth, on the model. I, I, in your hand. You're gonna put it on the bench, you're gonna oh, put you're the gonna scan flags it. in it, scan it, the whole entire restoration. If it's perfect, uh -huh. send that to me. I'm gonna take that STL file and I'm gonna send it to the mill because we can go ahead and insert the tie bases Ah, right, and I'm going to send that to the mill as zirconia. It's going to mm. come out and be exactly what you scan, exactly because what they're you're wearing. Using the land, the scan flags to merge. But you still have to model match your hybrid with your design. It's right. our, it's our. No, it's already been, it's already been designed and it's already been perfect. It's never going back into three shape. It's going straight to the mill. So basically, doing the same thing. If if this is not if the changes changes that were made were occlusal adjustments mm. and in size of ledge position, but we're not talking midline shifter no, yeah, yeah that. that's, a com that's basically close, yeah. almost a complete redesign right mm -hmm. but this is i've adjusted it right it has changed but i like the changes and approve of them and want exactly this right mm -hmm. in that instance i would just i would just scan that send that so back you're scanning to us. the intaglio surface also I would the whole entire oh, restoration. Yeah. You got a scan integrity. And you're going to make from that using the scan you're just going to basically say that's a raw STL and you're just going to mill what you see. You want scan the flags scanner. in that? Scan flags in that. Yeah, yeah because then we're going to actually have the precise location of of the tie bases. Now remember, we've already we already that's know that the basal side or intaglio side fits this you know, to the model, to the gingival correctly, accurately, right? And then I'm going to send that to the mill. I'm going to get it out in zirconia. By the time it comes out, you will have already sent me back the models because I still mm -hmm. always go back to Sweet. master cast, go yeah. back to an so analog So when you submit your cylinders, that's where if there was any inaccuracy in the intro rolls, because the problem I'm ha having with this, okay, and I mm -hmm. want to know if I'm wrong. I mean, I may be totally wrong. But if you don't scan it on the model, Right. Okay, if you don't scan it on the model and you just scan flag it and you just scan the entangle and everything and you're showing I'm showing you where the tie bases are. Right. You're still reducing the accuracy of this if I'm right, if I'm thinking of this right, to the accuracy of your scanner, right? So in terms of where your tie bases need to be, so you still have to put it back on the model. You still have to put it, so it has to go back to the analog model for cementing of the tie bases without right. it out. Like, I would not cement that oh, without yeah. the master cast. Right, right, right. But with having the master <clears throat> cast, I could cement the divergence is not going to be that great, or at least shouldn't be that great. If we're looking at when we do these, there's actually increased spacer setting for them. This is something part of the fabrication process from years ago mm -hmm. to take all of that into consideration because they can never bind. So in the laboratory, on the cast, they can never bind. If they bind, that can cause an issue, right? Right, right. Um, so there's, I'm going to use a term that sounds totally, it's, it's going to be, it's going to sound terrible, but it is what, it kind of is what it is. There's a little bit more of a slop factor in these. Yeah. Right. I know, I was waiting for the <laughs> word to come It happens for, to <laughs> dentistry, man. <laughs> mm. <laughs> then there would be, say, for a molar to a, to a preparation, right? Right. There is a little bit of wiggle room. That's, that's, that's also cement gap. Yeah, it's Something purposely goes wrong. That's built where in fail, there, yeah. right? That's where you want so, it to fail anyway. I mean, I think, and this is just me talking out loud, but because we we all had kind of a different opinion. It's interesting. We mm -hmm. each had a different route we would go. But, I mean, I think that that would be a solution as far as, you know, now if you need to make changes, yes, you got to go and we got to do the model match and all of that. And we got to mm -hmm. gather it and scan it back in and go mm -hmm. back to design and change. But, I, I mean, how do you – if everything was perfect – 
And, you know, the problem was we didn't want to send back the conversion other than mm. duplicating the conversion with an impression like we talked about, mm. yep. other than taking uh, a scan, a digital scan. Yeah. We just want to, you know, we got to need to make some changes. How do you feel? The changes have already been made, mm. but if, to if the physical provisional. You make me nervous with your scanning and just going to final. I will say. <laughs> I know, that's big. Yeah, I, I thought it was going to just be you know, I'm going to toss that right in there I mean, and see what kind of bomb I just dropped to the mix. The best thing. Mm. The, the best thing. Let's do the best it's thing. It's just to send them, send the lab. Right. The, the prosthetic as Give it is, back to and me. Put yep. that and put the patient back in the conversion or, yep. or alt- alternatively, you have you guys make a second. That's a right. second, yeah. That's, the, and, that's and what just, I just wanted. Yeah. yeah. So, so the the one we didn't discuss in our previous episode was making two hybrids, two Print hybrids, one yeah. and one the patient wears for a long term transitional. Yeah. Now, if you're gonna do Lars Boma's bio yep. matching, then well, then you, you need, need it back. You need that back. So, if I what I would say is, if you have a perfect hybrid transitional hybrid and the patient loves it, you know, function everything is where it needs to be. I would do two things. I would take an actual PVS impression in the mouth, full arch full palatal engagement, everything else, mm-hmm. and then scan that digitally with the bite and the opposing, which would give us a dual model match. Right Now, to miss a dual model match is going to be extremely hard mm-hmm. because we have three files, pre-op, which is our initial design, the actual model scan, and then the digital scan. The upper lower we did purely with the digital scan mm-hmm. was extremely accurate. So, so I think, yes, model matching might not be you know, always predictable. I think if you take your time and you have enough anatomical landmarks and those kind of things, I think you can be, because you're matching in three axes, actually more than three axes. There's, you know, there's a lot of points we can look at. So a good impression with a digital for me would be a great jump. Right. I think that's what I would do in mom's mouth if I cannot get that hybrid out. Most accurate, take the hybrid out, send it back to the lab. Yes, that's sure. number one. And Second that's great. And I, so I think, again, going back to the novice clinician. Yeah, I think that's what the novice needs to do. You, you need to mm. be thinking here from the beginning to mm. factor into your fee the potential of just making a second long-term mm. provisional. Is that is right. that a fair statement, if, especially if you're maybe starting off with this so that you have that wiggle room to not have to take it back, take it away from the patient? Yeah. Maybe to save some money, what you can do when you go f- to your prototype is have us print one and have us mill one. The mm. milled one, the long the one we do with, with uh, double crossing PMMA, that stays in the mouth and that's right. what the patient uses. Okay. I would say let them walk with that for a couple of weeks, make sure everything is where it needs the to be. The printed one is the traveler. Yeah. Then take the, the long term PMMA out, put the printed in, make some small adjustments to that. Based upon what you did that, in the long term. What you right. did in the long term, yeah. And say, okay. all right, you like everything like this. I think what Jack said earlier, and this is crucial, if there's any changes to be made, do another prototype. Do it, mm. Just you know, do one. It's, I would it's rather not, do it's five not prototypes it, yeah. and not charge you for it than do a final that we've spent hours on creating and have to start right over. If you're making a bunch yeah. of changes, and you guys know what they are, if you're communicating mm. with your lab and right. they're like, look, let's just make another prototype here. Let's just make sure. Yep. Yeah. You know? it's, yeah, it's and there's so nothing wrong with that. We don't, so we don't, we don't, we don't wrong with that. Like our point with all this discussion is, you know, again, brass taxes. Well, people want to the, skip steps. People John. want to skip steps, and they we want need to, to skip, just. Yeah. It's we need just need. We want to hear. It, people's important people hear mm-hmm. that you know this is somebody's paying you good money to create this mm. prosthesis for them, and uh, this patient is this is a potential life changer. It's a practice builder or breaker, or breaker. Uh, if if you don't do it well, um, and and it's a potential referral builder or breaker. From the sure. surgeon who's doing these cases, so if it means spending five hundred dollars on a second long-term prototype, even amen, yes, yeah. and it's well worth it in the scheme mm-hmm. of life here to sleep better and to know that you're going to have the it best guarantees. possible results. I mean, at yeah. the at the end, it should be a twenty. You know, you 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 can you can block forty-five minutes. It's a twenty-minute delivery, and the less the rest of the time celebrating with the patient. Mm-hmm. And, exactly. and that's 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 what it should be when you get to that final instead of the uh oh. Right. right. And that's and that's and that's an absolute and, game ender. And just because we didn't go back to a prototype or just because we skipped through this that. step. Well, let's, yeah. For the last last ten minutes or so here, let's talk about the actual zirconia. 
Mm -hmm. What is going on in the lab right now? Yeah. When we send that prototype back to you and you say, we say, 100%, this is it, match it. Gotcha. Make it happen. Okay, so. Make it shine. Put the last five minutes of glaze on there. (laughs) Whatever you're doing. <laughs> like, so I'm going like to kind of tell, tell, us, tell us about your magic. Tell, tell us, us about what matters. Gosh. What, so what matters today? It I'll is, turn my is, microphone yeah. off right now. <laughs> Do you mind? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take I'm the wheel and kind of back and start the wheel, steering yeah. from here. All right. It, this, is, this is a huge, this has been for me a, a really big part of my life and kind of just mm-hmm. dedication to our cause, which is dentistry. Um, it's, it's been a huge part of my life. The the magic in it, the zirconia itself is the success of the restoration at that point has a ton to do with fabrication method in the laboratory. Um, for years and years, I've consulted for laboratories. I've consulted for companies and, you know, time and time again, I go into a laboratory and I see the same issues and the same problems and the same, you know, even in the forums, the same things technicians have got, and as an industry have got, a lot better at processing zirconia than they were, uh, but I'm still seeing issues. So one of the issues, and and not to sound like I'm lecturing here, but I've just I just this is like second nature for me, is the handling of zirconia in the laboratory during the uh, fabrication process. If you treat zirconia with respect. It will treat you with respect. If you don't, it will absolutely destroy you in the laboratory. And this mm. is this is God's honest truth. And you know some of the things you want to watch out for. Of, of course, the designing and the milling of it. Um, that's all basically standard. There's there's nothing really interesting or stand out that really stands out there. Uh, when you get to sintering, uh, sintering is not that big of a deal, with the exception of your sintering program and your temperatures, uh, there you'll see differences in the quality or the translucency of the zirconia as far as fully mature and immature, right? But still, at that point, no harm, no fall. Uh, It may be way uglier than it could have been, right? And not as aesthetic as it could have been, but that doesn't guarantee failure from the laboratory side. From that point moving forward, everything that happens in the laboratory is absolutely crucial to the success of the zirconia. Um, A lot of times I tell laboratories, so it's either a couple of these things clinically or it was compromised before it even left the laboratory. And that's a, that's a big, that's, and they don't realize it. Hmm. And it might, you've milled it, you've centered it. Yes. And now we're going forward and you say that, Hey, this is, this is where the The problems are. This is it. This is at this point moving forward. So let's go right out of the gate. So we go ahead and check it. We go back to the analog. We go back to the articulator. We always do. And we're rolling through function. And then let's say something's off. Let's say something's wrong. And the technician's first instinct is to hammer it, right? Um, now, I'm, I don't subscribe to the you can't grind zirconia, but I do subscribe to the you can't beat the hell out of zirconia, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and no, absolutely no high speeds. If if you come to the lab here, you'll see I, have, I haven't used a high speed because I... I haven't used a high speed in eight years Mm. uh, because I will not let it touch zirconia, at least in the laboratory side. Now, clinically, you have irrigation you can use, right? And there's there's all of that going on. But laboratory side, they're they're not using irrigation. Uh, They're taking a high speed and they're just wailing on zirconia. That's that's rule number one. No high speeds. Um, Mm. Let's go to firing the zirconia. So let's say everything's ready to go. Let me just say real quick, that just like... uh that just eliminated several labs. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, I know. Well, you, you'd never want to walk into a laboratory and, and hear the technician say, hey, cool, look at it, it's shooting sparks when right. I grind it. Look at this way is up. Turn off the lights. That's, Let's watch the no. show. All right, so continue. I look at it, I'm, getting, I'm getting chest pains, and I just got two more gray hairs. So, so no um, high speeds. Yeah, no I'm high speeds. That, um, clear. Yeah, very, and, and they will argue you on that. And it's like, you don't need the damn high speed. I will cut that air hose with a Bard Parker right now. Put the high speed down <laughs> and it. step away from the high That's speed. Don't thing. touch the zirconia with the high speed. The second one, and most important one, and believe it or not, for the years that I've been lecturing this and teaching this to technicians and labs, they've pretty much adopted it because it, it makes sense. As an industry, we early, very early on, we treated zirconia as a metal. 
although it is nowhere near a metal and it reacts very differently. Mm. So if you have a full arch, just say cobalt chrome, you can put it up in an oven, raise it up very quickly, and drop it down very, very quickly. And it's because that's how the metal absorbs energy and releases energy. Zirconia, on the other hand, it takes a ton, a ton of energy to get it to accept it, and it does it very slowly. Once it's accepted that energy, i.e. heat, right, it doesn't want to let it go, mm. and it holds onto it for a very, very, very long time. So firing programs for zirconia. Now, a PFM, you could fire in 13 minutes, right? Up, down, very easy. It is catastrophic to put your zirconia through that stress, and that's what it is because technicians ask me, so what's stress? What do you mean... Um, uh, thermal shock, right? That stress is it takes so much energy to get that zirconia to that point, heat, to the firing temperature. You want to go very slowly. You want to let it absorb it at its own pace. When you get to that high temp, right, say we're doing ceramics, say we're glazing at 710, you're going to long-term cool back down to 450 degrees. When it opens, you're still not going to touch it for another 15 minutes. My zirconia firing program and all the firing programs we have here are an hour, no matter what it is. So if it's if it's at it's building porcelain, it's a one hour program. If it, and we, it's, I've been telling technicians for years, this is not a case that you're rushing 30 minutes before UPS shows up at the lab, right? Because when you start horsing it in that porcelain oven, you're going to cause at some point it could cause catastrophic failure because the stress to the zirconia is too severe. Mm -hmm. uh, now let's say, because it's a, it's a one hour, if, you're, if I'm glazing it, it's one hour. If I'm building ceramic, it's one hour. That's a long program. Man, John, how many other that is, does that eliminate? Man. Yeah. <laughs> it's a one hour program to fire zirconia each firing. So if you got two porcelain builds and you got one glaze cycle, you're looking at three hours firing time alone oh, right but jack most people aren't using facial cutback anymore so okay you, monolithic yeah. exactly the same so mm -hmm. i use Thank i do you, a jack. lot with mio it's still one hour so if i take if i take the case and i do my mio um liquid ceramic one hour firing i come back and glaze it one hour firing and then i come back and add my mio uh structure one hour firing, I'm still three full hours. Mm. It is it is very, 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 very important. So you mean you gotta have more than one oven? Dang it. Mm. Yeah. If, if when I'm doing two, and actually that's it's easier to do two arches than it is one because I rotate them back and forth like this, right? Because mm. the firing program is so long, by the time that I've gone and stain and glazed this one, this one's coming back out of the oven and you could rotate them right through. How many layers are you typically doing on just your general you know, case. I know it's probably case specific, but counting the gingival and counting the any cutbacks, cutbacks or, or anything. So, there. so not doing, believe it or not, not doing almost at least on full arch Earth. next to zero cutbacks. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's been because the zirconia product itself is so advanced. Mm -hmm. um, you're not gaining anything by cutting it back anymore. We'll get the occasional single central or something like that. You know, we do a cutback zirconia or zirconia six through eleven, something like that. We'll do cutbacks, but for the most part, everything's still monolithic. Um, what you're looking at is going to be like a meal, a liquid ceramic with a ceramic kind of um, uh, structure that goes over the top. But the firings uh, remain the same. One, two, three. Still three yeah. firings, mm -hmm. still three hours. Now, even if a laboratory, because I'm going to catch them one more time, even if we get through the firings, then I'm going to catch them before the case goes out with the steamer, with the pedal to the floor, <laughs> hammering it absolutely mm. hammering that giant chunk of glass. And I call it, I stress glass to the technicians all the time. They're like, why are you calling it that? Because that's exactly what it is. And look at what you're doing to it right now. Mm -hmm. um, because they'll come at it with the steamer and they'll just blaze away. So talk right? about what these three things result in, in the lab and or in the office. Is this, can this cause just a, a full-on fracture? Oh, is this something you're going to see hear, like it's one of early, my, or does this cause late failures? What does this typically do? Yeah, this is one of my, my biggest, biggest issues is, is when I hear zirconia breaks. My first response to that kind of statement is, no, it does not. 
who's processing your zirconia. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's because of I've had a lifetime or a, a, whole, a whole career of success with the material. And Mark would tell you the exact same thing if he was sitting right here and somebody said zirconia breaks, he'd turn around and say, no, it doesn't. So, so it, let me just say this. What you're saying is I get very passionate a, about this. No, it's good. Occlusion does not cause full arch zirconia prosthetics to break. Okay. No, occlusion, occlusion, well, yeah. Incorrect occlusion. Inco incorrect occlusion, right? okay, absolutely, sure. 100%. Yeah. Sure. yeah, no, absolutely. I'm but talking about lab, lab side, lads, lab, lab side, side fractures only. Causes, yeah. Okay, yes, lab side fractures here. only. I haven't got the clinical side, no. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. You're, still, you're still getting to the clinician. Yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure. Just okay. want to make sure. Make sure. If, yeah, if you can see, wow, I'm really hammering the technicians. Wait till we wait till we switch around. No, and, <laughs> hey. and the technicians, and, and believe it or not, I've seen, I, I haven't seen really any put it's it's a thousand times better than it was oh, yeah. early on it was absolutely disastrous on the laboratory side which would equate to the mishandling of zirconia and what does it all equal it equals micro fractures it equals thermal shock um i mean it's glass it's very strong glass but at its heart it's a ceramic right mm -hmm. and so if you think of of anything like that that you know would you want to shock or i mean you might as well you might as well drop it on the concrete and let um, me back you up on this you know when we when we started with zirconia <clears throat> they tell you it's an alloy so in a lab technician's mind let's treat it like alloy yeah but we never realized how long like you said these large structures take to heat up so when we were doing layering porcelain on these cases we couldn't get the porcelain to vitrify or to bond even if we used bonding layers and we had a lot of failures and the porcelain almost looked brittle. And we f eventually figured out that there's just no heat to get this porcelain to bond and vitrify. Right. So it's extremely important to slow down that, that heating process. And another thing Jack taught us, and I think you, you didn't you give yourself enough credit with this, we used to center the case and then do final contouring. Oh, green stage. What Jack stage taught us it. was finish the case in green state and do only small adjustments in final. I think that's yeah. huge. After after center, everything is green stage finished, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like chalk. All of the yeah, all of the work, a hundred percent of the work is done to the zirconia mm -hmm. arch in the green stage. Even mm -hmm. if I do seven through ten and I'm working on the case myself, I green stage finish it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're doing some contouring, things like that. All the contouring, everything. When it comes out, and it's a skill that you have to master because obviously we're 25% bigger. You can't go to the model at that point. You got basically, you can, you have to visualize, you you can look at what you got. And, and if you follow and stay in between, put it, let me say, stay in between the lines, mm. right? Uh, if you don't go outside of lines, then you got no harm in I, I changing wanna, I the restoration. Stop. Just, just a second. For those listening, just, just just think about this for a second, what he's saying and the skill that it takes, okay? Imagine that tomorrow you had to start doing all your composites on this tooth that was 25% bigger and then put it and then put it in the patient's mouth and it would shrink to the correct size, you know, and your anatomy be perfect. Right. And your yeah. right. yeah. So, so you're, you're making it, you said, you just said one little quick thing. You said, it's a skill you have to master as in passing. And you say you want to save a thousand dollars per arch on your name. Right. And so I just, I just don't want to, I don't want to overshoot that because I, I, I think that that is a, 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 not just a skill quote unquote, I think that's that's really where it's wisdom. The well, that's where mm. the, the it's the it's the real artistry. joining together of yeah. the artistry and the technology because it's mm. exactly what it is. It's you you have to understand everything about contour, but yep. now you're working mm. on something that's twenty five percent larger that you can't mm. put on a model. You lose a lot of your reference points. That we have so. to match exactly what was there before. That right. the information so you guys sent us right to, mm. to yeah. a, a huge degree. It's kind of like at the point where Yoda <laughs> blindfolds Luke, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank that's you for exactly that. little... that's exactly what it is, right? But I, but I think <laughs> our industry technology sometimes the threat mm. is it makes us lazy. Mm. We're thinking technology can replace everything, and I think yeah, a lot no. of labs make that mistake. Oh, we can design it on three shape. We'll pop well, it in the furnace and, how about, and send it out. How about this? When they don't green stage finish it, because this is what they're doing. This in, in <clears> green <throat> stage finishing is something that that I was part of developing very very early on. 
Then they're getting that zirconia arch out, and they're like, oh, look it, I have to open up the embrasures. So they start disking them. Mm. Oh. Jack oh. got rid of every disc in this lap since oh. he joined. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that was we. That was us. Put the disc away. Mm. The high speed and the disc and the steamer and the 13-minute mm. so firing you're making, program. you're making love to your zirconia, Jack. I mean, you oh. sure yes. are. Yes. yes. You're, you're you romancing it handled, the zirconia. It is handled with kick gloves. And I, it absolutely is, is, is I got to send you guys a picture of It's like Jack. Wagyu beef. Right, that's what massage. I'm hearing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I gotta send you a picture of Jackie. He looks like a, a coke head when he works on Zirconia because he is. Can white I get that the for the show? Yeah, so, oh, yes, I, I, I get share that some image. good ones for you. Yeah, and believe it or not, and, and thanks to these guys, I'm finally after after 10 years of living in Zirconia dust. I'm actually wearing a mask too. And this is if I if I have something to pass to the technicians. Um, you know, I woke up one day and I was I turned 40 and and I w was n I wasn't a marine anymore and I realized I wasn't bulletproof. Um, zirconia, mm. please wear a mask. Yeah. Um, green stage finishing it. It is thick. If you've ever seen it wet, it is scary to imagine what that's like in your lungs. So all guys listening out there, these guys between Conrad and Dries both were on me right away. That's very important. They gave that to me. They said, put a mask on. They're like, look at here, covered in zirconia. So, uh, you, so, so you've done your, you've done your, all of your heating and cooling properly you've done you, your contouring yep. you've done your yep. you, you've gone through all the steps and these are all places where there can be huge issues absolutely um, and if if you do that i can guarantee you success mm -hmm. beyond your wildest dreams and it's because mm -hmm. i've seen it um i don't you know it's mm -hmm. it's somebody and i'm going to say it's it's somebody very very well known came out with the zirconia study a couple of years ago and and i didn't read it um, I heard lots of grumblings about it, but a lot of what I did here, I absolutely disagreed. And the, and the reason why I've absolutely disagreed with it is because I've lived this for so long, right? And, and I've, I've personally seen it. Um, interesting things. I've seen weird and strange and bizarre zirconia myths. Um, don't sandblast zirconia, right? And that was a long one. And Ivoclar, at this time, and I'm going to kind of call them out on this. Sorry, Ivoclar, uh, used to stand there and say, and their reasoning behind it was this. Well, aluminum oxide is harder than zirconia. Therefore, the aluminum oxide will embed itself in the zirconia and right. layered ceramics will blow off. <laughs> well, if that was true, we would never have ceramic on any PFM substructure that we've built in the last 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Um, I've never, ever, ever seen one on the technical side issue with sandblasting zirconia. So it's very interesting, kind of all these things that we've come up with as an industry moving forward. Um, and I've processed so much of this that, that it's, it's, I, it just becomes second nature of what's successful and what's not. So and I let, could me, let me ask you about um, one of the next steps, and I know there, there may be more you want to talk about okay. too in between here, but looting cylinders, because mm. there's a lot of discussion. That's a big one. About where the failure points yeah, are. And there's a lot of discussion about too, like this FDA cleared cements for right. for cylinders. What should we be what using? What should we be what using? Can we right. use? What and, and you know you mentioned in the last episode a bit about the the cement space and you know right. uh, tell me a little bit about your thought process on looting and and cement space and and you know are you planning with for in, in terms of are you are you trying to leave more space so that if there's going to be a failure, it's going to be a cement failure? Are you leaving less space? You know, what, tell us a little bit your thought so, process. So, so I'll go I'll go from spacer <laughs> forward. Um, on the spacer issue, uh, I never left. So, so we talked about traditionally with kind of the old Carl Misch technique and leave more space because that would be a point for failure. Um, what I've seen now with modern cements is the cement actually holds stronger than the zirconia itself as far mm. as a break. Um, so it's not breaking free, at least not in my experience. But that being said, when it comes to cement, um, the spacer that I use is actually so that the restoration does not bind up on the cylinders, right? Gotcha. Right. Um, I don't want to increase any tension when you're going to final torque around the arch or during the fabrication of it. Uh, so there should be a little bit of give to it, just just a touch. Um, when we get to cementing, I've done and used the same protocols forever. When I first cemented the first one, I almost absolutely refused. I said, this is ridiculous. I'm, and now Zircon's on with cementing them. And that's kind of where I was up against the wall. I said, this is ridiculous. I'm not a clinician. I have no business cementing this restoration. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, 
now fast forward how many years later and, and I have a, a rock solid cementing protocol. I use multi-link uh, cement. I use Monobond Plus. Um, I sandblast the inside of the zirconia. I sandblast the titanium tie base. This is very important. Mm -hmm. Titanium oxides very, very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So if I put it on my bench and come back, well, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes later, it is definitely darker than it was when I freshly sandblasted it, right? You're not using like a co-jet or anything like that, just aluminum oxide? Just aluminum oxide. And I don't know if this has to do with any of the success that I've experienced, but I sandblast it, I steam, I steam the tie bases off, and immediately go to cementing. Okay. Immediately. immediately. If I'm not going to cement it within the next five minutes, then I'm not sandblasting it till I'm ready to cement. Because right? of the fresh. oxidation of the tie Because of the oxidation, absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so it's, if it's cement, very, very fresh. You're, what you're saying is if, if the cement comes loose from a tie base that you cemented then there's a verification problem i no, i don't know if it's a verification mm, problem probably. because i mean they can come free they, mm, okay. they can come free um i've just been really really successful with it okay. i've seen I've, I've you know heard of a lot more tie bases coming free more often than not um i haven't seen that many as a complication myself uh, using using this kind of protocol, um, then Monobond Plus, you know, drying length sit, and then uh, multi link. Should using something other than uh, Monobond and multi link? You know, I keep using it because it's it's worked so good. Um, sure. There there's possibly other great cements out there, but I haven't ventured off the path. Uh, yeah, if it's working, then yeah, I've working. I've had such good success with them. There could mm. be there could be. Uh, several that would give you similar results, just as excellent as the ones that I've seen. But but, but to get back to his question, don't you agree that if a zirconia snaps when it breaks right down the screw mm. axis, because that's normally that's where they fail. That's verification. I think that's verification. That's verification. I think yeah. it, it wasn't verified, wasn't seeded, and that's the patient just absolutely one hundred percent verification. And is that? And I mean, because I want to get in. I want to start moving into that as we start getting closer to closing out this episode. It's been awesome. Um, so, so just talk about the failure points a little bit. You've talked about several potential failure points from the lab side. Um, what are the things that are failing uh, and what do they tell you about the problems causing those failures? We've identified some of those as we've gone right. through, but after you deliver these or, or when you're delivering these, are there things that the clinician needs to be aware of uh, that, or, or, or really have we already kind of covered all of the things that if you do properly, um, you know, talk about if there's any other things that, that are causing failures that you so that you're ver seeing. Verifications, the mm. first one on my list. It and really is the first one that comes up. And another point for working abutment level, working implant level, is you can much easier radiographically verify that everything yeah, is right. seated. Totally. You'll mm -hmm. see that interface much quicker. And yeah. I think it's crucial. We had a case fail a few years ago. Implant just failed on number 10. And we realized afterwards the frame wasn't seated 100% and the screw engaged and just orthodontically pulled that implant out of the bone, you know, in eight or nine months. But it was so tough to see because it was kind of hidden under it. But when we went back to the radiograph, we could actually see it wasn't seated. So I think it's extremely important to radiographically verify because you'll either destroy the implant or the yeah. pros. If you, so so if let's get into um, delivery day. A delivery day. Yeah. Mm. Um, when you when your clinician goes to deliver the case, any any tips that you give them anything special that you that you want them to do, or is it just basically, hey, if this At thing screws point, in passively, you, then you're yeah. Good. If if you've done everything, if you followed the step protocol all the way to that point, mm -hmm. and you had a hundred percent approval on that final prototype, you're talking. Down. It is it is twenty five minutes, so it's mm -hmm. taking that out, it's torquing down, and it's uh it's the rest of the time is celebrating with the patient. Yeah, um, and if the, they these deliveries, using water these deliveries spray, are right? yeah, yeah adjusting using make sure you irrigate. These deliveries are very mm -hmm. exciting. If you they really really are, and I've always said to our guys, if we do a cobalt chrome, if we do a nano, or we do a zirconia, if you get to final delivery and you have 30 minutes worth of adjustment, take it out of the mouth, take a new bite, do something, call us, take it yeah. out, but don't grind for hours to get the same. Yeah. There's no reason to if do we, that. Something's right. went gone wrong. Let the, let the lab figure it out, and if, figure they, it out. Yeah. if something messed if we, up, we'll figure it out. That's what I always tell Plus, I think Jack probably hears the zirconia crying 
from yeah. the yeah. office. <laughs> you feel you may actually a show up at your office and take <laughs> it out of your hand <laughs> and cut your air hose with a barred parker. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what I heard. So man. So let's. I, I want to just ask one, maybe more question, and, and just any other. I want to let want to let you guys kind of close it out with any other right. thoughts. Uh, final thoughts on on you know these types of cases but what do you do because I, i've seen this many times when people ask us questions about full arch or we're talking at some of our meetings that we go to um many of these cases unfortunately are not planned the way they need to be planned we we know right. that that is really ah. if we go back to the cause of failures right like in the yep. beginning it is, is poor True. treatment planning is you know 95 percent of probably what's really going on but when when you get to the point along this pathway there comes a point sometimes where you realize that a screw access is going to be coming out the wrong location. Okay, you, you're working through your, your prototyping or you're working through your setup, whatever path you go down, and you see that you've already corrected an angle by 30 degrees, for instance, and your screw access is coming out the facial of number eight. And, mm. and you don't have the ability to not use that implant. You know, you need that implant from a span standpoint. What are some solutions that you talk to your doctors about in cases like that? I've seen things such as, you know, cementing crowns over the access, you know, milling a crown prep into the prosthesis. Um, mm. We've seen things like customized multi-unit abutments with more angle correction. You know, what are oh, I know you guys solve these types of problems sometimes. What do you, you, could, what do, you, talk you could about? You could do a custom abutment and sit on top of it. That's another big one, right? Mm. And and but you know, I'm gonna kind of go this way. It's it's gonna be, and I think Conrad, I'm hoping, uh, goes with me. <laughs> it might be time for a talk about a different type of restorative option, mm. right? Moving um, beyond zirconia. Moving beyond zirconia at that point, because what's nice is we have so many different restorations and so many different fabrication methods that we can cover any, like we were talking about the lip support, right? Mm -hmm. If lip support's an issue, zirconia is not your solution, right? And it, they kind of play all, they go back and forth, the finding that that restoration that fits that particular you know, patient's individual need. That's the great thing about prototyping need. and setups is right. that you actually you could find identify stuff it. out and you know before what? you even get to the zirconia. Exactly. And technology now is allowing us to be such a synergetic team that you'll find a good surgeon, a guy that's prosthetically driven, that looks at these cases from the back end forward. You know, mm -hmm. The word so prosthetically planned has been so overused, but it, it truly is what we need. You know, how much bone reduction we need. Make sure the case is planned correctly. Have a relationship with your lab. That's probably my biggest advice to yeah. clinicians. Don't go. be Have a the case relationship. Plan. You know, and, and we talked about this off the air. Go to the lab. I'm Dr. ABC. You're Conrad. You're Jack. Make friends with those guys. We're you your know, next door that, neighbor. We're important. like your, uh, you know, you see us at Christmas mm -hmm. every our, year. Kind our of lab deal. door is open. 24-7. Mm -hmm. You want to tour the lab, the stop by. Thing. I, I would oh, say huge. that I've told John this and maybe even said it on the show. I've learned as much or more from my lab technicians, and I've had a limited number over the years, uh, than just about anything. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think they're they're just as good of a resource as any you know, continuing education that you can mm -hmm. get. Uh, experience is worth, you know, we just, we talked briefly about understanding how to contour something that's 25% larger, knowing how that technology mm -hmm. works. You know, that type of experience can, I mean, think of how that can translate into looking at a setup Listen, or looking at a, you know, a treatment plan. It's not worth saving 500 to $1,000 yep. on no. lab bill. And, and we're here, and, and we're very welcoming for it. I mean, there's no yeah. egos, there's mm -hmm. no nothing. It's, it's in the cases that we work the closest with the the guy that can text me at you know four in the morning or twelve at night. Those cases are the most successful each and every time. And you, you can email me, and I will give you Jack's cell phone number. <laughs> I was going to say yes. So to close it out here, we're going to give you guys the last word. We really appreciate yeah. what you guys have done for dentistry. I mean, the pioneers of zirconia, mm -hmm. and really, like you said, Jack and Conrad, both of you guys have. You've got some sweat equity in, into what you're all teaching. No. And I want you to tell people where they can find you, okay, and uh, where they can find this PDF um, or no, the, hard copy the manual. of what we've really talked through the last couple episodes, which has been really at 
you know, an amazing time yeah. of discussing this. This is kind of one that I think people will keep coming back to yeah. to kind mm. of find out some little pearls. There's pearls in here, and you'll have to dig it out. You might have to listen to this once or twice before you dig this up, dig this one, you know, really, really well. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and where people can find you and maybe how they can use your services. So I'll, I'll start yeah, with go this. For you know, it. I, I, I always tell people when I do CONUS lectures or study clubs, even if you're not going to use us and you have a problem, pick up the phone and call us. Mm. You know, have your lab tech call and say, Jack is probably <laughs> the most down-to-earth guy I've ever met, probably one of the most talented zirconia technicians ever, and he'll help you. you know, don't get in trouble with one of these cases. And if you're using an inexperienced lab and they can't finish the case, stop, take a step back, give us a call and we'll help you with that. I mean, we're there to help because I think, mm. you know, we're all for the, the patient's best interest. Um, if you got any questions or you'd like a protocol manual, it kind of discusses everything we talked about over the last two episodes. Um, you can contact me at Conrad, C-O-N-R-A-D at AbsoluteDentalServices.com. And if you have a question for Jack, Jack at AbsoluteDentalServices.com. That's it. Awesome. Jack, you want to close awesome. us out? Well, this has been a, a, I think, I think that this will become for us the, oh, wow. the episodes that we can, when we, cause this is, I mean, we talk a lot about full arch. Now I feel like we have an episode we can refer people to yeah. and we can say, this is a starting you, point, right? If you're starting and you want to understand how to accomplish one of these cases, the major things to look at, this is kind of the starting point, And then you can grow from there. Or if you've been doing it a while and you want to learn something new, talk you know talk to these guys they can kind of mm. maybe take you to the next level and that's what it's all about with the show taking people hopefully from whatever level you're at taking you to the next level that might just be a little bit or that might be a long way but we're really happy to have uh, both you guys here jack and conrad it's been an awesome show uh, we want you guys to check us out tell us what you think about this show give us some feedback number one thing you can do to help us in this podcast to be more successful is go to apple Podcasts, leave us a review uh, tell us what you think. Give us a five-star review. That boosts us up, makes us more visible. Number two, tell your friends, tell your family, like, tell your share, coworkers, subscribe. put posters up in the grocery store, whatever it takes. <laughs> we just want to get the word out about what we're doing. If this is, you know, having it, you know, what else too is tell your dental reps. That's been very useful for us is having dental reps, having company reps to hear about what we're talking about mm -hmm. at a high level and they can refer their own customers to hear what we're talking about, hopefully learn about how to do some better dentistry. Uh, also make sure you check us, check us out on social media, Facebook and Instagram and the Twitter and the interwebs. We've got a website, we've got all the things. So come check us out, learn more about what we're doing, connect with us. For Conrad, for Jack, for Wes, I'm John, and this has been another great episode of The Dental Guys. <laughs> <laughs>